So hi, my name is Emily, as you've been told. Um, I am a master's student in Dr. Jamie Ellis's lab at the University of Florida. Um, I've been there for about a year. August of last year is when I arrived in Florida. Um, I'm originally from Michigan, so beekeeping down here is totally different, and I'm absolutely loving it. Um, I've been a beekeeper for about five years, um, and I've worked on uh, various different honeybee nutrition projects um, since I started beekeeping. Um, but I just absolutely fell in love with beekeeping um, and decided that I wanted to research with bees. Um, so that's why I'm getting my, my master's with uh, the Ellis Lab. Um, so my thesis is completely focused on pollen substitutes. Um, how many of you feed pollen substitutes or, or pollen patties to your bees? All right, all right. Um, so hopefully this will give you a little bit of an idea of um, how bees are using pollen subs um, and maybe some things that you can do for your bees to uh, help their nutrition. Um, so this talk is in particular titled Tracing the Fate of Pollen Substitutes Throughout Honeybee Colonies. Um, so a little bit of overview. Um, I'll give you some uh, project background, uh, the questions uh, that I'm focusing on and some of our predictions. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about the methods and then my results and observations so far. So the project isn't completely done, but all of my samples are gathered and I have a kind of a good idea of what we're seeing with my project. Um, and then I'll also end with some future steps. So to begin, what are pollen substitutes? Um, well, they're an alternative source of proteins, vitamins, and fats, um, alternative to natural pollen. Um, so it's uh, important to note that the commercially sold um, pollen substitutes don't actually contain natural pollen. Um, but then again, you can also buy them um, from a place like Daydant or Man Lake, um, or you can make them yourself. Um, so there are various ways to uh, use pollen subs um, for your bees. And some of the common ingredients include soy flour or brewer's yeast. Those are usually the two major components of, of pollen subs. And um, sometimes they also include skim milk products, egg, corn gluten, <laughs> pea protein or potato protein. And that's just some of the, uh, some of the major ingredients. Uh, different recipes um, or different diets that are sold commercially can have um, different uh, ingredients. Um, and then how are the pollen subs used? Well, you can either feed them to your bees in a patty form or like a, a cake form, and you can put them directly into the hive. Um, usually they're placed right um, on top of the brood nest, on top of those frames. Um, and then your bees can get to them and uh, use them in the brood nest immediately. And then uh, you could also feed in dry powder form. Um, so usually this is um, placed somewhere outside of um, your hives in the apiary. And then your bees will actually go to the, uh, the dry powdered feeder and collect the powder and bring it back. Um, so those are usually the, the two major ways of feeding pollen subs. Um, my project actually focuses on the patty form. And then why do we use pollen subs? Well, unfortunately, it's getting tougher and tougher to find natural sources of pollen in the environment. Um, and that can be difficult for bees that need a really healthy, robust diet, especially with all the pests and pathogens that they face, right? Um, and of course, beekeepers need healthy bees even when the pollen is scarce. Um, so beekeepers oftentimes spend significant time and money on pollen subs, um, especially the commercial beekeepers. Um, and there has been some previous research done on these pollen subs, um, but unfortunately it shows very mixed results on how the pollen subs actually affect colony health. Um, some researchers have found positive effects, positive growth in population and in brood. Um, and then others have shown, you know, neutral effects where some have even shown negative results. Um, and because the research is so all over the place, um, we really wanted to step back to the basics. Um, in fact, uh, studies at the Ellis Lab have mostly found neutral um, effects of these pollen subs. Um, so, because of that, we're not really sure uh, how they work. 
Um, so basically, we ask the question, when a pollen patty disappears, where is it actually going? How are the bees using it? Do we know? It's just gone, right? Um, so that led to my current experiment to trace the fate of pollen subs throughout a colony. Um, and in that, I had three major questions. Uh, my first is, do the adult bees actually ingest the patty? Or you know, could they be ejecting it out of the hive, for all we know? Um, yeah, exactly. That that could be that could be one sign. Um, <laughs> um, and then, do adult bees feed patty directly to the larvae? Um, and then the third question is, do the bees store patty like they would bee bread? And I have a few um, hypotheses based on these questions. So this is basically what we what we think we're going to see. Um, we do think that the adult bees ingest the patty, um, and then. We, do, we don't think that the adult workers feed patty directly to the larvae, and we also don't think that the workers store the patty like bee bread. And this was based on some preliminary experiments that Randy Oliver did. I don't know if you're um, familiar with Randy Oliver. Um, so he did some kind of uh, some quick experiments uh, similar to this, and that's uh, what he was thinking was happening. Um, so let's get into some of the methods. Uh, first off, we needed to find a way to follow the patty throughout the colony. Um, and initially I thought, oh, fluorescent dyes, that would be so fun if my, uh, if my samples glowed in, the, <laughs> in UV. Um, but it actually turns out that pollen nectar and uh, gut tissues of the bees autofluoresce. So that means that they would glow under a UV light just like my fluorescent dye. Um, and they will glow in all different colors. Um, so once the bees start collecting a pollen uh, of a different color, um, then it oftentimes would be the same color as the fluorescent dye that I tried. So, you know, week to week it changed and I, I just couldn't make those fluorescent dyes work. Um, and this is just a picture of a bee gut, a bee that had been fed um, a lot of fluorescent dye. <laughs> Um, but because the fluorescence didn't work, we wanted to step back and try something a little bit simpler. Um, so we used Brilliant Blue FCF, which is just blue food coloring. Um, and that worked quite well. Um, it's water soluble, so it's very easily mixed. Um, the unnatural blue color stands out um, amongst all the other colors of the hive. And then um, it's also traceable with spectrophotometry. And spectrophotometry, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit deeper um, into the methods, but basically it's, um, a spectrophotometer is a machine that um, will pass light through a sample and it'll measure the absorbance of that sample. And this blue dye um, will give us an absorbance value, a very specific absorbance value. So if we read the sample, we can figure out whether it's there or not. Um, and then it's generally considered non-toxic, which is a plus. But we wanted to know if the Brilliant Blue is actually bee safe, because we didn't want to stick it in the colonies and all of our bees are dead, you know? <laughs> so we started off by doing a simple experiment in the lab um, with bees in cages, and we fed them uh, kind of a broad range of different concentrations of uh, the dye. Um, just to make sure that they weren't actually dying um, when we fed it to them. And it turns out that it was non-toxic, and even the ridiculous amounts of dye that they ate did not kill them. So that was good. We could move forward. Um, and then I had to work on mixing the Brilliant Blue into different pollen uh, sub recipes. Uh, so I started off with Ultra Bee. I don't know if you're familiar with Ultra Bee. It's, it's probably one of the most common ones. Um, and it turned the patties very, very green green, blue, and then it also mixed quite evenly, so that was good. Um, and I started sticking these in full colonies, and I wanted to figure out which concentration uh, of the dye was enough for me to find it in the colonies. Um, so I found the kind of the sweet spot where I, I started to find it in the bees' guts. So that was giving me an idea of what I was going to see as well. Um, but then once we did all these preliminary experiments, we needed to decide on which recipes we were going to test. Um, so we decided that we would test Ultra Bee, 
um, AP23 and Megabee because those are three of the, the most common commercially sold patties in the US. Um, so we figured that would uh, cover kind of a, a broad range of what beekeepers might use. Um, and then I had to start thinking about my uh, full uh, scale field experiment. Um, and for that, we decided to have uh, six different groups of hives. Um, I had three treatment groups uh, with seven colonies in each, fed Ultra B with the dye, Mega B with the dye, and then AP23 with the dye. Um, and then I also had three control groups. Um, so I had a negative control of nine colonies, and um, three, of, three colonies in each of those was fed the different patties. Um, and basically, uh, we fed those patties without dye, because we wanted to make sure that when we put those patties in and they didn't have dye, they definitely didn't have dye. We weren't detecting it there. Um, so we weren't getting any other signal um, that looked like the dye um, when we were collecting those samples. Um, and then we also had a consumption control. And I'll explain that a little bit more. That was kind of a unique idea from Dr. Ellis. Um, I'll explain that in another slide. Um, but then, importantly, we also had a positive control, um, which was sugar fondant. So we know bees really like sugar. So we put the dye in it, and we knew that it was going to go all over. And we could compare that um, to what they were doing with the patties and the other groups. Um, but that made a total of 44 colonies, um, and they were all spring uh, splits that we made this year, and all nukes, so just five frame uh, nukes, which the smaller hives made it a little bit easier to track that dye. So I don't know if you can see it too well here, but this is an example of a mega bee patty full of dye. It's very green, um, and we just placed that on top of the hive. Um, and then this is what my fondant looked like. Um, we specifically chose fondant because it's soft and pliable, um, so it's similar in texture to the patties. We figured they'd maybe interact with it in a similar way. Um, and again, it basically just shows how the dye would move throughout the colony when we know they like the diet. Um, and then a little bit more about the consumption control. So Dr. Ellis had this idea that we should stick something in the hive that we know they don't like and see how the dye moves around. Um, so I went to the craft store and bought a bunch of different things that I thought, oh, you know, this is similar in texture to a pollen patty. Uh, can I stick it in a hive? Sure, let's go. Um, so the one thing that worked was Crayola Model Magic Clay. Um, I tested it in the lab and figured out that the bees absolutely will not eat it, even when they have no other source of food. So I knew it wasn't some other nutritional source for them. And then I stuck a patty in a hive, and it went everywhere on the ground. We put screen bottom boards on them. It looked like it had snowed underneath. Um, and it was also just all in front of the hive, where they had flown out with it and ejected it. So I was like, that's my patty. That's what I need. Yeah, it was was really great. <laughs> um, so yes, it shows how the diet moves throughout the colony when we know they don't like the diet. Yeah, a question? Yeah, were all of your groups the, in the same apiary? Yes, they were. What did you do about drift between colonies? Great question. Um, so actually, I'll back it up here. It might be hard to see. Yeah, it is hard to see in this picture. But we did put um, different colored shapes on the front of the colonies. Um, that usually helps them figure out where to go. Um, they can at least remember that pattern on the front of their hive. Um, but then, just in case there was also drifting, that was what my negative control was for. So if any dyed bees showed up in my control, the hives that weren't fed any dye, I would know that they had drifted around the apiary. And then I'd have to adjust my results for kind of the amount of drifting that I saw. Um, so that was, that was just one, one way to control that. I'm glad you asked. Um, all right. And then I also had an evaporative control. Um, so I basically wanted to uh, measure the amount of weight that was lost in the patties uh, when the bees weren't actually eating it. Because I was also going to measure the consumption rate of the patties. Um, so I found old packages back in our workshop. And I knew, well, packages keep bees in, so of course they can keep bees out. Um, we kept them out from eating the patties. And we just knew how much um, 
how much water the, the patties lost uh, and weight when the bees weren't eating them. And you had another box, an empty box on top of that. Yeah. The yes, they were all closed up. Um, so once I had my uh, groups decided, I had to prep my patties and then feed them. Um, and I came up with a standard mixing method to make sure that my patties were all mixed the same way between groups and uh, mixed evenly. Um, so basically, I took a paint mixing uh, drill bit and had it at the you know a similar speed and um, for each patty mixing, and then I um, mixed them all for the same amount of time. And then I also put in the same amount of dye um, in each treatment. Um, and then we also wanted to feed the same amount of patty um, for each uh, feeding. So we um, put out 100 grams of patty on 10 by 10 centimeter wax paper sheets uh, to keep them standard across treatments. Um, but then unfortunately that the bees ate the fondant a lot faster than they ate the pollen patties, which isn't so much of a surprise. Um, so we ended up having to feed them uh, 300 grams of fondant at a time, just with the same amount of dye as a regular 100 gram patty was. Um, and they ate that at about the same rate then, so we knew they were getting a similar dye intake. Um, and then after the first feeding, we just fed them ad lib, so we just wanted to make sure that they had dye at all time and diet at all time. Um, and then we also measured consumption rate. Um, and this is what my hive setup looked like. Um, basically, we had a medium super and just two frames on either edge of the box. Um, and then we put the patty above the brood nest in the center here. Um, and that was just to leave us space so we could easily um, check on the patty every single day to make sure um, that they always had patty, so we were always feeding. Um, and then we also put these frames on the edges uh, because we wanted to see if maybe they would store directly in those frames. So those were drawn, uh, drawn comb, empty comb. Um, and then, let's see. This is my feeding schedule. Um, so basically, day zero, I fed the bees. Day three, we s took all of our samples. Uh, day eight, we took a second round of samples, and then day 14, we did our third round of samples. So this study lasted um, two weeks in total. Um, and then we also collected debris underneath the hives. It might be a little bit hard to see here, but we um, put trays underneath them, um, and each hive had a screened bottom board. So basically, anything that um, the bees uh, lost as debris collected in these trays. And this, you can see, has a lot of blue in it. This is the clay, so this is the consumption control. This is what they were ejecting all over the place. Um, so once we um, knew that they were getting rid of that, we could compare this amount of debris to the amount of debris they were um, essentially ejecting or getting rid of um, when eating the pollen patties. Um, so here is the number of samples that we collected. There were a lot. <laughs> so every single colony, we collected um, you know, about 100 adult bees. And we did that three different times. So for 44 colonies, that is 12,672 adult bees total. Same with the larvae. So we specifically collected fifth and star larvae because we figured the older they are, the more pollen or dye that they're going to have in their guts. Um, and same, a lot of larvae. <laughs> and then similarly, we collected 96 bee breads um, three times from 44 colonies. And that totals 38,016 <laughs> samples. It's a lot. <laughs> we are. Luckily, we, I think we found a way to get our answer without going through all of them. But it was still a lot for uh, all of my volunteers that were helping me collect these samples. Did you see the coloring in the larvae? Oh, sorry, repeat the question? Did you see coloring, this blue color that you give, in the, in the bee larvae? In the larvae. I will get to that in just a second. Don't want to don't want to give it away quite yet, but good question. 
Um, so that resulted in sampling, sampling, and more sampling. Um, so basically, we'd open up the hives in the morning, collect our adult bees, and then we'd grab a frame where we knew we were going to get uh, enough bee bread and enough fifth and star larvae. Uh, we took those frames back to the lab, and we just picked them out one by one and froze them until we were ready to process. And this also might be a little hard to see with the lighting, um, but this is an example of one of our trays of bee bread samples. And the bee bread, oh thanks, that's great. Um, and the bee bread samples were particularly hard to collect because they crumble all over the place. I felt so bad for my volunteers. They got a little frustrated with that. Um, but one of our main observations was that the fondant goes everywhere. So you can see in this picture that there are green larvae, at least with the fondant fed bees, right? And there's green nectar, there was green bee bread, and there was even a green queen. So it might be hard to see, but right there, we've got our queen in the cage and she's got a blue abdomen. So we knew that fondant was going absolutely everywhere and our positive control worked the way it was going to. So that was really exciting. Um, and then after we collected all those samples, we had to figure out a way to process all of them. Um, so we started with the adult bees, and that was really easy. We just cut off the abdomens of the bees, um, put them in vials, and then homogenized them um, in ethanol, and then centrifuged them down. Um, so basically, the ethanol gets um, extracted, or the dye gets extracted into the ethanol, and then we're able to uh, read that on our spectrophotometer, our machine, to um, test whether the dye is present. Um, and here is an example of green bees and control bees um, that had just been homogenized. So the difference was pretty stark. It was great. Um, and then this is our nanodrop spectrophotometer. Um, basically, you just take a teensy tiny amount of your um, ethanol from your sample and you pipette it onto this tiny little pedestal, you hit measure, and it'll give you the absorbance value, and it'll tell you if the peak is there, if the, if the dye is present. So this is maybe a better example. Here's another um, very green uh, bee gut, and then here is the peak that's generated um, by the spec. So you can see here that at 630 nanometers, that dye is present. That's the specific wavelength that it shows up. And then the larvae sample processing was a little bit of a challenge, um, just because the larvae are so small that there's not a lot of dye that's held in their guts. And it's really hard for the spectrophotometer to actually read that, we found. Um, so you can see here, these are our positive control larvae, super green. So even though we could see it, we weren't getting positive reads on the spec uh, spectrophotometer. Um, so instead, we decided to do um, just visual observations. Um, and we had a few different people um, observe, uh, look at all of our larvae and say, yes, it's green, or no, it's not. Um, so here's a good picture. This is one of our controls that didn't get dye. All of the larvae just have their pretty orange guts like they usually would. And then our positive control, which has a lot of green. Yeah, question? Yes, that, that is the fondant, yeah. So now we can get into the results. Oh, you had one more question before then? Can you show us the result is uh, your, that groovy stuff at larva? In the larva? Yeah, but it was uh, feeding, not uh, padding. It was feeding that stuff from... Uh, the fondant, the fondant yes. yes. So what's different between larva in that colony mm -hmm. and in what that is Yes, results. I'll get into that. <laughs> Just about to. You're jumping ahead of me. So um, one disclaimer I have is that we haven't actually run any statistical tests. Um, so these are really just preliminary obs uh, observations and results. Um, but once we run the stats, we'll have really concrete answers. Um, but this is our uh, graph that was uh, generated from the adult bee guts. Um, and again, it might be a little hard to see, but our negative control, zero bees with dye. So no dye in our negative controls. 
54% of the bees that we found in our fondant fed hives had dye in them. The consumption control also worked. We just had um, less than 1%, so just a few here or there that ended up with the dye in their guts. So you were just like picking it up and like spitting it Yeah, it was just a contamination thing because um, it sprinkled all over. Um, and then with our AP23, Mega B, and Ultra B, we had 31%. 17% and 24% respectively. Um, so they comparatively ate a lot more of the pollen patty than um, say the consumption control. But then they didn't eat quite as much as the fondant fed bees did. But we, it's pretty safe to say that the adult bees do actually eat the pollen patty. So we know that much. Um, Yeah, absolutely, no problem. Yeah. Um, and then this was just to show that essentially the visuals that we did between different people were very similar. So because we were seeing similar things, we feel really good about those results. Um, just because visualizations can be kind of objective, but if we're getting the same ones, that's um, hopefully a good sign. So with the larvae, our negative control, zero larvae had any dye in their guts. The positive control larvae, 99%, so almost every single larvae um, in the fondant fed hives had dye and received fondant. And the consumption control, less than 1% again, so that means that it was just a little bit of contamination. Um, the AP23 was interesting, 9%, um, whereas the Mega B and Ultra B were 1% or a little less than 1%, which was very similar to our consumption control. So preliminarily, we would say that the larvae do not get any pollen patty, um, directly at least. Um, the AP23 is a little interesting. The, there was one hive that had about 40 uh, larvae in our samples that had the, the dye in their guts. Only one hive, though, out of seven. Um, so we can't quite explain that. We don't know if it's a contamination issue or this one hive was just going rogue and decided to feed it to the larvae to some extent. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, but it's interesting if we do throw out that one hive, um, if we consider an out, it an outlier, then it um, the AP23 drops to less than one percent, like the other ones. So. Um, we're still trying to decide what to, what to do with that outlier, um, but it seems to be uh, that they do not feed it to the larvae. Yes? Did you uh, measure the sugar content of the pollen patties mm. um, to see if um, it would boost it? Um, sure. Like the mm -hmm. So we haven't done that, um, but I think that would be a really interesting thing because obviously the more sugar is in them, the more attractive they are. Um, so I think that could be a really interesting next step. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these recipes are proprietary, so we don't, we're not allowed to know all the ingredients. Um, but with a few tests in the lab, we could figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that would be pretty easy. Um, would you mind sure. Sure, so we used fifth instar, which is just basically the oldest larvae that we can find. Um, so it's right before they pupate, yeah. Um, but we figured, so they start getting fed um, pollen at, I think, day five. Four? Thanks. So day four, and then um, we wanted to uh, get the larvae that were about day eight because we figured they'd have four days of feeding um, before we got them. So hopefully more uh, pollen in their guts. Is it not on the third day that they start giving them pollen? No, fourth. The fourth? Yeah. Hmm. That's why you kill a draft after two days because the first two days are just oil gel, correct? Barba gel. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we think, of course, that the adult bees do ingest the patty and the larvae are not fed the pollen sub patty directly. So just to sum up the results again.
So some future directions. Um, we still want to do a visual analysis of the adult bees, just to compare them to uh, the larvae. Um, so we have the, the, the reads from the spectrophotometer, but we just want to back that up again with some visual reads. Um, and then we also have to analyze the bee bread. Based on just simply observation from collecting the samples, I really don't think that they do feed um, the, or they don't think that they do store the pollen patty like bee bread, um, but we'll see what the numbers tell us <laughs> before I say that for sure. But um, we also have to weigh the hive debris and make comparisons. Um, and then after we're done wrapping up this project, I'm starting another project with pollen patties again. Um, and with that one, I'm going to be comparing the consumption rate of pollen substitutes with and without a natural pollen flow. Um, so we're interested to see if, if there's a lot of natural pollen coming in, do they consume it less? Um, for consume the pollen patties less, for example, um, because there will there are plenty of beekeepers that will feed pollen patties uh, even when there's a natural pollen flow, and we're not sure if that might be a waste of money. Yeah. Were you feeding uh, sugar um, at the same time as you were feeding pollen patties? We did not. Yeah, we didn't want to. Um, I know that's a common practice, uh, but we didn't want to add any more sugar because we thought maybe. Maybe they would spend less time with uh, the pollen patties. So, yeah. Were you seeing a visual amount of hive debris in your, in your collection trays from the pollen patty hive? Not a lot. There was some. There was some. But I feel it, it seemed like, you know, maybe they just lost a little bit. They were a little clumsy with it, and it <coughs> sprinkled down. Um, so we'll have to we'll have to weigh it and compare it. But with the clay, it was the trays were just loaded. Awesome. They were loaded. It was, Very smart. yeah. It, <laughs> I owe that to Dr. Ellis. That was a good idea. Um, yeah, absolutely. There was also a little bit of fondant in the debris trays. So, <coughs> All right. And these are my acknowledgments. I have to thank everybody at the UFB lab and all of my amazing volunteers because this project has taken a lot of work. So, all right. Thank you so much. <laughs>